I encourage you to open your Bibles now to the Gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, I'm going to begin reading at verse number 14 and conclude at verse number 29. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse number 14 and concluding at verse number 29, reading from the New King James Translation. The Bible says, and when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him it throws him down he foams at the mouth gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out but they could not he answered and said "O oh, faithless generation how long shall I be with you how long shall I bear with you Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has, it, has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him but if you can do anything have compassion on us and help us Jesus said to him if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears Lord I believe help my unbelief when Jesus saw and I'll stop there. We'll get that later. But just look at verse number 23 and 24. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I want to talk this morning on the subject when faith and doubt collide on the highway of life. When faith and doubt collide on the highway of life. This is one of my favorite stories in the gospel according to Mark. Although the other two synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke record this same miracle healing exorcism. Mark's version of this exorcism by Jesus is more thorough and more vivid than both Matthew's and Mark's version of this same event in the life of Jesus. The predominant reason for my affinity to the Markan version of this miracle demonic exorcism is because Mark's focus and attention, because of Mark's focus and attention on this father's agonizing struggle with his faith in the midst of a difficult and trying and critical circumstance. When you look at Matthew's gospel and when you look at Luke's gospel, nothing is mentioned by either one of those gospel writers about the father's struggle with his faith. Notice, if you will, Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 through 17. The Bible says, and when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has an epileptic and he has epileptic and suffers seizures uh, severely. 
for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And so the Bible lets us know that Jesus dealt with the situation, but there is no mention in Mark's, uh, Matthew's gospel about this father's struggle with his faith. Look at Luke's account in Luke chapter 9 beginning at verse number 37, concluding at verse number 42. The Bible says, Now it happened on the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out, and it convulses him so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. Again, we see that Luke does not give us any account whatsoever about the father's struggle with his faith. Now look at Mark, and we want to pick up in verse number 17 of chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, in verse number 17 through verse 24. The Bible says, and watch the difference here, watch the difference. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. It, he foams at the mouth gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, and he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Mark is the only one who focuses on the father's struggle with his faith in the midst of this devastating and traumatic personal family tragedy. Mark is the only one who allows us to see his father's sincere and intense struggle with his faith. If you were to read this account and read Matthew's account and read Luke's account, you would understand that there is a purpose behind Mark's inclusion. In his gospel account, if I were to characterize Mark's version of this miracle using a modern day colloquialism, I would characterize it as a keeping it real moment in the life of an everyday Christian. In other words, Mark lets us see that real believers with real problems can sometimes have real struggles with their real faith. Mark says, I'm just keeping it real. This father who truly believes in Jesus 
keep that in mind. He truly believes in Jesus, yet he is truly struggling with his faith in this intense moment and traumatic event in his life. And let me carefully work my way through what I'm about to say because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. I believe 100% in the inspiration of the Bible. I believe, in fact, a thousand percent in the divine inspiration of Scripture. My view of inspiration is the same as that of the Apostle Paul. Notice what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 from the NIV. The Bible says, all Scripture is God breathed and I wanted that version because the King James and the New King James they say all scripture is given by the inspiration of God but that word inspiration literally means God breathed in other words it came from the mouth of God all scripture is God breathed and is used for, t for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, I believe that the Bible is the very word of God from the mouth of God. How did God give it through to us from his mouth? Through the instrumentality of human hands. In other words, God inspired it and men were used as his instrument to record it. Look, if you will, at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. The Bible says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one who bore them along as they recorded God's divinely inspired word. Now, I'm taking time to go there because I want you to understand that I believe in the divine inspiration of the word of God. I believe that every word in God's book, the Bible, is inspired by God. All of the events are inspired by God from Genesis to Revelation. In theology, that view of inspiration is called verba, verbal plenary inspiration. Now, stay with me now. And what's important about verbal plenary inspiration is that God ensures its accuracy and veracity but he also uses the personal lives the personal experiences and the personal personalities of the authors that he uses to write his word in other words their personalities and their experiences and their life events come out in the divine script in other words Moses is murdering of the Egyptian taskmaster is in the script Jonah's hatred and anger for the Ninevites are a part of the script David's adultery is a part of the script Hosea's wife's infidelity is a part of the script Job's frustration with God is a part of the script. Gideon's attitude toward the Lord is a part of the script. Listen, if you will, at Judges chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Watch Gideon. The Bible says, and the angel of the Lord, and usually when you see that in the Old Testament, the angel of of the Lord notice that angel is capitalized and Lord all capitals the angel of the Lord that's usually a pre-incarnation theophanic appearance of Jesus Christ and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him the Lord Yahweh God is with you you mighty man of valor 
But watch Gideon's reply to the Lord. Watch the next verse. Verse number 13. Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Doesn't seem like there's much faith right there. But it's not about whether or not there's much faith. What I'm trying to tell you is that divine inspiration gave it to us as it was and guarantees that it is an accurate account of the event. So when I talk about divine plenary inspiration, I'm simply talking about the fact that God uses human personality. God uses human events. He uses the experiences of individuals and guarantees that what is in the book is indeed accurate and is indeed true. And so I want you to get my point. In other words, we see real human beings, not superhuman beings. We see real human beings with real problems struggling with real issues in the Word of God. And I thank God for that because it gives me hope when I struggle with my issues in life. It gives me hope when I see my frailties and my shortcomings in life to know that the Bible is full of men and women who had frailties and shortcomings. And I thank God that he put it in the divine record. We see them in their strengths and in their weaknesses. We see them in their faith and in their doubts. We see them in their successes and in their failures. We see them in their moments of courage and we also see them in their moments of fear. And when you look at the background of the Gospel of Mark, and this is why I spent some time sharing that with you. When we look at the background of the Gospel of Mark, most theologians believe that Mark used Peter as the major source concerning the life and teachings of Christ. How did they come up with that? Well, notice what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 13. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 13. The Bible says, and these are Peter's words, she who is in Babylon, talking about the church, the she is the church. Babylon there, of course, if you've been following me in our study of Revelation, He's talking about Rome, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greet you, and so does Mark, my son. That's talking about John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark. And so what that tells us is that Peter was Mark's spiritual father. So. When Mark uses Peter's experiences with his walk with Jesus Christ that is still in agreement and in alignment with divine plenary inspiration because it's still inspired by God. But here's why that's relevant to our text. Because when you study the life of Peter and when you study the life of John Mark, both have incidents in their lives recorded in the divine record where they both struggled with their faith. Look, if you will, at Mark chapter 14, verses 66 through 72. We all know this story. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to, to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. 
a second time the rooster crowed then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice you will deny me three times and when he thought about it he wept so here is an incident in the life of Peter where his faith was weak he struggled with his faith and he lost the battle and he denied the Lord Jesus Christ that's a part of the holy book that's a part of the holy writ but John Mark also had a moment in his life in his walk with Christ where he had a moment of weakness struggling with his faith and he turned around and went back home look if you will at Acts chapter 13 beginning at verse number 4 concluding at verse number 13 Acts 13 4 through 13 the Bible says so being sent out by the Holy Spirit this is on Paul's first missionary journey they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus and when they had arrived at Salamis they preached it the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews they also had watch this John as their assistant this John is John Mark this is Peter's son in the gospel this is the author of the gospel according to Mark now when they had gone through the Isles of island of Paphos they found a certain sorcerer a false prophet a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus an intelligent man this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God but Elimus the sorcerer for so his name is translated which stood them seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith then Saul who also is called Paul filled with the Holy Spirit looked intently at him and said oh full of all deceit and all fraud you son of the devil you enemy of all righteousness will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord and now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind not seeing the Sun for a time and immediately a dark mist fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done being astonished at the teaching of the Lord now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos they came to Perga in Pamphylia and watch this the Bible says and John departing from them returned to Jerusalem now notice what the Bible says the Bible says he was their assistant but yet the Bible says after this event John Mark left that party and went back home to Jerusalem and when Paul got ready to go on the second missionary journey Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them but Paul said I'm not having him because he forsook us on the first journey and I don't have time for spiritual weaklings on this journey so John Mark struggled with his faith and John Mark failed the test so what I want you to see is that both John Mark the author of the gospel of Mark and Simon Peter Mark's spiritual father both had moments of failure in their faith yet both overcame their failures and went on to accomplish great things for the Lord and what God wants us to see is simply this he is showing us that our failures do not have to be final yes we can mess up and yes sometimes we fall down yes sometimes we fail to show faith like we ought to but God says your failures don't have to be final John Mark got up and John Mark gave us the gospel of Mark and it is the first written gospel it's not first in the canon but according to historians his gospel was the first gospel to ever be written and Simon Peter of course went on to be the keynote speaker on the day of Pentecost failures in faith do not have to be final and we thank God for that and I'm persuaded that Mark recorded this event of this man's struggle with his faith because he could truly identify with his struggle but not only could mark identify with his struggle but his spiritual father in the faith could also identify with his struggle Peter could identify with his struggle but I want to go a little further not only could mark and Peter identify with this man's struggle with faith I'm certain that every child of God listening to me right now 
has one time or another struggled with your faith and if you haven't keep living the day will come when you will struggle with your faith I don't care how strong your faith is if you tell me that you have never at any time in your life ever with your walk with the Lord ever had a weak moment of faith then I know your problem is not with faith it's with lying amen I, all of us have dealt with our faith and had to struggle at some moment in life all of us are going to have those moments in our lives when our faith is challenged and let me tell you something church I don't want to be around anyone who has never ever had to struggle in their walk with Christ first of all I don't believe that they're telling the truth number one but secondly because they're so holier than thou and so heaven with bound that they're no earthly good and church when I when I talk about watch this now so you'll understand from whence I'm coming when I talk about struggling with your faith I'm not talking about questioning the existence of God or questioning the validity of Jesus Christ when I talk about struggling with your faith I'm simply talking about whether you believe that God will come to your aid in a moment of need that's what I'm talking about I'm not thinking or saying that you doubt the existence of God or doubt the validity of Jesus Christ or doubt the veracity of his word I'm talking about you believing whether or not that God will respond to you when you call upon him Amen. it's possible to believe wholeheartedly in the existence of God and still struggle with whether or not you believe that God will answer when you call on him contrary to what you might believe those two concepts are not incongruent with each other because that's exactly what we have in Mark chapter 9 this father believed in Jesus so much so that he brought his demon possessed son to Jesus to be healed if he didn't believe in him there was no need to bring him to Jesus this man believed in Jesus yet he still had a faith issue and I would venture to say that at one time or another we've all been where this father was believing yet doubting knowing yet wondering trusting yet questioning it's called being human it's called being real it's called life look at Mark chapter 9 verses 14 through 16 the Bible says and when he came to that's he is Jesus and when he came to the disciples he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them immediately when they saw him all the people were greatly amazed and run into him greeted him and he asked the scribes what are you discussing with them and he asked the scribes what are you discussing with him watch this now uh, I want you to see this this is typical of life Peter James and John had been on the mountaintop with Jesus and they had just seen the transfiguration of Jesus before their very eyes I want, to, I want you to see this stage I want to set the stage go back to Mark 9 verses 2 through 8 because I want you to see what transpires here now after six days Jesus took Peter James and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them his clothes became shining exceedingly white like snow so as no launderer on earth can whiten them and Elijah appeared to them with Moses and they were talking with Jesus then Peter answered and said to Jesus rabbi it is good for us to be here and let us make three tabernacles one for you one for Moses and one for Elijah because he did not know what to say for they were greatly afraid and a cloud came and overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying this is my beloved son hear him suddenly when they had looked around they saw no 
one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Amen. Now watch this. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured before their very eyes. They, they saw his divine glory shining through his human flesh. Not only did they see Jesus transfigured, but they saw Moses, the great lawgiver. And they saw Elijah, that great prophet who called down fire from heaven and who was taken back to heaven in a whirlwind. And then they heard, they heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Peter, James, and John were at the pinnacle of spiritual glory. In fact, it was such a wonderful occasion that Peter got beside himself and the Bible says he didn't even know what to say, but Peter got beside himself and he said, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles, three booths, three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why do you want to do that, Peter? Because I want to capture this moment. I want to capture this glory. And I want us to just stay up on this mountain. You and Moses and Elijah and me and John and James, we can all stay up here on this mountaintop and just bathe in this glorious moment. They were in a moment of spiritual ecstasy. And Peter said, I don't want this to end. But hear me well. That's not realistic. That's not how the real world works. In the real world, we cannot stay on the mountaintop forever. In the real world, we must descend from the mountaintop of glory into the valley of suffering, pain, sorrow, and despair. That's life. Peter, James, and John went from the mountaintop of spiritual splendor where they saw a glimpse of the glory of God into the valley, that dark valley of struggling humanity where they saw the destructive deeds of the devil on display. They went from the glory of God from the devil's work. From the glory of God to the devil's work. They left the scenes of glory, joy, peace, happiness, and heavenly wonder. Only to walk into a scene of pain, weakness, suffering, and misery. They walked into a scene of a young boy under demonic influence, a father in deep distress for his child, and the other nine apostles deflated, defeated, and confused because they were unable to cast the devil out of this young boy. That's life. Here they were just the day before. They were on top of that mountain with Moses and Elijah and Jesus and the father saying, this is my beloved son. And then they come down all happy, full of joy, full of God's mighty, mighty splendor. And then they come down and they see all of this darkness and destruction. That's life. One day we feel like the devil is no match for us. One day we feel like we will never struggle with our prayer life anymore. Oh, I got this thing together. I'm on the right track now. Oh, I'm praying. I'm like I'm in the very presence of God. One day we, we can't wait to read the word. We're so excited about the word and full of enthusiasm about the word. One day we feel like we have conquered all of our fears and we feel like we've conquered all of our struggles and that we're through with sin. And none of the sins that once appealed to us appeal to us anymore. And one of those, none of those sins that used to trip us up so easily, none of those things trip me up anymore in other words we feel like we have conquered we finally have arrived i'm through with lust i'm through with fornication i'm through with this adulterous relationship i'm through with alcohol i'm through with gambling i'm through with drugs i'm through with pornography i'm through with hatred i'm through with envy i'm through with jealousy i'm through with prejudice i'm through with covetousness i'm through with pride i'm through with meanness i'm through with lying I'm I'm through with profanity and whatever else you've struggled with in your life and your walk with Christ one day we feel like we have conquered it all we are conquering warriors on top of the mountain but then we come down from the mountaintop 
and real life hits us. The job calls and the job tells us that because of the pandemic we're closing our doors for good and the job is gone. You walk out of the doctor's office with a question mark concerning your health because there was a spot on your liver. You get a phone call that your child is in trouble and your heart is devastated. You are the child in trouble and your heart is devastated. You walk into your house and your spouse says this marriage is over and you're wondering why, what happened and your heart is devastated. Your spouse or your mother or your father gets dementia and you have to deal with that horror and your heart is devastated. A spouse, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a child dies and your heart is devastated. Your finances go haywire. Your car breaks down. Your roof starts leaking. And God gets harder and harder to see and harder and harder to hear. And before you recognize it, some of those things that you thought you had conquered, you're right back there again. Now you're struggling with praying. Now you're struggling with reading the Bible. Now you're struggling with worship. And some of those habits that you put down, you go back and you start them again. Because now you're dealing with real life, not the mountain top. Up. my point is that the real world and in the real world real stuff happens should it be like that should it be like that no it shouldn't be like that no we should not give in when life happens to us and real things that cause us to hurt and suffer happen to us we ought to hold on but I'm trying to preach a message of hope to those who don't always hold on and if you're uncareful when you're dealing with real life, we'll find ourselves in the valley struggling with our faith, trying to catch our breath, trying to figure out what just happened to me. I was on the mountaintop yesterday, and here I am in the valley today. Peter, James, and John were on the mountaintop one day before this experience, and the next day they're in the valley. But hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You said, Brother Williams, how can you say hallelujah, praise the Lord, when you just talked about they came down from the glory of God and, and went down into the valley where they got to deal with the devil. The reason that I can say hallelujah is because the same Jesus that was on the mountaintop with them is the same Jesus that's in the valley with them. You see, God says, I'm on the mountaintop with you, but I'm also in the valley with you. And I want you to know that I'm a God who works at the top of the mountain, but I'm also a God who works in the deepest dark valley. God works when we're up, and God works when we're down. His strength never falters. Let's get a picture of this boy right quick as we move through this lesson. Look at Mark chapter 9 verse 17 and 18. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out but they could not Lord have mercy I want you to see this boy I want you to try to put yourself if you can into this crowd into this scenario and I want you to be that father and I want you to see this boy he can't speak this evil spirit takes control of him and throws him down. It causes him to foam at the mouth. It causes him to gnash or to grind his teeth. It causes him to become rigid and stiff all over. Mark chapter 9 and verse 22 tells us that it tries to destroy him by throwing him in the fire and in the water. 
Mark chapter 9 verse 25 and 26 tells us that it took away his hearing. Mark, Luke chapter 9 and verse number 38 tells us that this boy was his father's only child. Luke chapter 9 verse 39 tells us that this evil spirit would seize him, cause him to scream and go into convulsions, foam at the mouth and, and then leave him battered and bruised. Watch this now. This is a horrific picture. This demonic spirit comes on this boy and it seizes him. And when it seizes him, the first thing that boy does is he screams out loud. Pain has come. He cannot hear. He cannot speak. And then he causes him to go into convulsions and throws him on the ground, sometimes throws him in the water, sometimes throws him in the fire. And he's down there wallowing and foaming. And not only is he wallowing and foaming, but he's rigid and he's grinding his teeth. His eyes are open. He cannot speak and his father is looking at this sight. Don't you know that his heart is hurting? Lord have mercy. It's hard for me to read it. And to think about a father looking at his child helpless I can't fix this problem every father wants to be able to fix the problems of his children but he can't fix it and I know as he looked into that boy's eyes that he could see the inside of his son is crying out somebody help me but he can't even speak and the father saw all of this and then when the spirit would leave him he would be battered and bruised but listen to me the father still couldn't help him this father is desperate for a cure for his only child put yourself in his shoes for a moment and imagine that that's your child just imagine the pain and the suffering you would feel. Jesus is the only one who can deal with the evil and the hatred that this man sees before him. Jesus is the only hope that this man has and it's the same now this is the same truth now this is the same truth that America needs to hear and the world needs to hear with all of the damage that the devil has done in this world the only true and real hope that the world has is Jesus Jesus is the only one who can deal with the evil and the hatred in the hearts of humanity the president cannot do it Congress cannot do it. The Supreme Court cannot do it. And there is no man-made legislation that can do it. Watch this now. Change must come from within. And when you change the inside, the outside will conform. Church, the devil was on the inside of that boy. And that's why his outward behavior was as it was because of who was in control on the inside. And when you can get the right Lord on the inside, then the outside actions will conform to who's on control, in control on the inside. Watch this now. So it is now. Whenever you see a person engaged in destructive behavior, that's destroying themselves and hurting others around them you know that that behavior is inspired by the devil the devil has but one goal and that is to destroy you and everyone associated with you look at mark chapter 9 verse 18 and whenever it seizes him it throws him down he foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid so i spoke to your disciples so that they could cast it out but they could not this is a pathetic picture because the disciples were powerless against this demonic spirit not because Jesus had not given them the power to cast out this demonic spirit but because they didn't have enough faith to do it look if you will at Mark chapter 6 and verse 7 and then verses 12 and 13 and you'll see what I say what I'm saying Bible says and he called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two. These are the twelve apostles. And gave them power over unclean spirits. 
Jesus gave them power over unclean spirits. Did they exercise it? Yes, they did. Look at verses 12 through 13. So they went out and preached that people should repent. Watch this. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So they had experienced already the victory of casting out many demons, but right now they are defeated because they didn't have enough faith. Look at Mark 9, 19, quickly. Mark 9, 19. The Bible says, he answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And church, I love this verse. You might say, Brother Williams, why do you love this, ver this verse? Because Jesus rebuked them for a lack of faith. He said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? And then he says, listen, listen, listen. How is it that you can say, Brother Williams, that this is a good verse? Because in that verse, go back, I want you to see it again. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? And then he said, bring him to me. That's my point of rejoicing. Church, that's God's grace, God's mercy, and God's love on display. How is that? Despite their lack of faith, Jesus said, I'm still going to help this poor father and his demon-possessed son. Church, that's shouting ground. Aren't you glad that the Lord does not require that our faith be perfect before he blesses us? Aren't you glad that in one, in one breath the Lord can rebuke us for a lack of faith and then in the next, bless, next breath say, come, let me bless you. Jesus could have said, go home, get your faith together and then come back when you get it together. But he didn't say that. He said, bring the boy to me. Church, how many times has God blessed us in spite of us? How many times has God overlooked our failings and our shortcomings and our unworthiness and blessed us in spite of us? I'm sure that it's been too many times to count. And I'm certain, I'm certain, I'm certain that God does it every day. Because every day we come up short in some area of our lives because we sin by omission and we sin by commission and we can sin by disposition. It's not sometimes that we're out doing something. Sometimes we fail to do what we ought to do. And sometimes we just have a bad attitude. But I'm saying in spite of our unworthiness, God still blesses our lives. So he said, bring him to me. Look at verse number 20. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, now watch this, they, the disciples, the apostles, the father, all of them, they brought him to Jesus. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. Lord have mercy. When I looked at this, it made me see just how hateful and mean and destructive the devil is. That's how the devil works. But he knows that he is about to lose his grip on your life. He does as much damage as he can on the way out. In an effort to leave your life in complete shambles. And so here he is, he sees Jesus and the Spirit seizes him immediately and say, well, I know I'm about to be cast out now, so I might as well do as much damage as I can. I want to break in him as much as I can. But what I love about the Lord is simply this. He is able to clean up what the devil messes up. Hallelujah. He is able to fix what the devil has broken. Hallelujah. And he is able to undo what the devil has done in your life.
life. And so I'm saying no matter how broken you are, no matter how bad it you are, no matter how bruised you are, no matter how much the devil has messed up in your life, if you give your life to Jesus, he can fix it, he can make it whole again, and he can clean up the messes that the devil has made in your life. Thank you, Jesus. Look at Mark 9, 21 and 22. So he asked his father, oh, I love this. How long has, he, has this been happening to him? I want you to hear the tenderness in the voice of Jesus. He sees this boy. He knows what's going on. He sees him. But Jesus said, how long has this been happening to him? It doesn't matter. Jesus doesn't need to know that in order to heal the boy. But God wants us to see the compassion of Jesus. He wants us to see the love of Jesus. And he wants us to see the dire, destitute situation that this father has been in. Because we, gotta, we, wanna, we wanna understand why it is that he's struggling with his faith. And so he says, from childhood, from a little child, the devil has been invading my son. Lord have mercy. God cares, church. He cares, he cares, he cares. And if you don't, if you can't say anything else this morning, and if you don't get anything else from this lesson this morning, I just want you to simply say, Jesus cares. He cares about me. He cares about what happened to me in my life. He cares about every moment of my life from birth to now. He cares about it all because he is a compassionate, loving, caring God cares about all of our years of suffering and pain but notice that the father's faith has been so damaged by the failure of the apostles that he's now wondering can Jesus even help him look at he says he says so in verse 22 go to verse 22 and often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. And the father says, but, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He says, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus, I'm so damaged. Jesus, I'm so hurt right now that I'm struggling with my faith. Jesus, I'm looking at my only child lying there on the ground, wallowing and foaming at the mouth and grinding his teeth rigid and staring out of his pleading eyes, knowing that he's sin on the inside. Daddy, please help me. But I'm powerless to help him. Jesus, if you can do anything at all to help us, please try. Please don't send me home with my child in the same condition. Lord, you may or may not, but you are my last hope. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but Lord, please try to help us. Lord, have mercy. That's the essence of what he said. I'm sure you've been there at some point in life. Perhaps our question has never been, if you can, but if you will. I'm not talking about asking God for something out of his will. I'm talking about asking him for something you believe to be consistent with his will. Lord, I need a job. Lord, I need a job. You, you said that we ought to work. I want a job so I can keep a roof over my head. Lord, please give me a job. Lord, I need reliable transportation to get back and forth to work. Lord, you said we need to work. I'm just asking for reliable transportation. I'm not asking for a Mercedes Benz or a Cadillac or a town car. I'm just asking for reliable transportation. Lord, I want to go into this area of the world and I want to do your will on the missionary field. Lord, I'm asking you, please let me go. Lord, just let me do it. Will you let me go? Lord, send me a spouse so I don't have to keep burning passion and lust. 
it's not a matter of whether or not you believe God can you know God can because God can do anything but fail but your doubt arises in the form of the question will God do it not can he do it but will God do it will God do it for me will God fix my problem that's the issue. Look at chapter 9, verse 23, Mark 9, 23. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Lord have mercy. Jesus said, pardon me, excuse me. You have the if in the wrong place. The original text simply says if you can not if you can believe but if you can all things are possible to him who believes Jesus said it's not my power that is in question it's your faith that is in question so don't put the if on me put the if where it belongs and the if belongs on your side not on my side if you can muster up enough faith to believe that I can do it then rest assured it's a done deal Church, whenever our prayers seem to go unanswered, we should never question the power of God. Whenever our prayers go unanswered, we should never question God's power. We need to check our faith. God's power is never the issue. If there is a power outage in our life, the problem is always on our end and never on God's end. You know, there are times when there have been storms and the power have, has gone out. And I call uh, 311 to report that the power is out. The first question they ask me is this, have you checked your breaker boxes? <laughs> they said, make sure that the problem is not on your end. So go check your breaker boxes and make sure that the breakers haven't been tripped. And if they're not tripped, then the, then the problem is on our side. And what I'm saying is that when you are having problems getting your prayers through, don't question God's power. Check the breaker box. Maybe you have the problem because we know God does not. Look at verse 24 chapter 9 as I try to wrap this up immediately immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears look at this with tears Peter understood tears John Mark I'm sure understood tears he said Lord I believe help my unbelief this is one of the most transparent statements in the Bible the man said Lord in all honesty I believe in you Otherwise, I would not be here. Nevertheless, I admit that my faith is flawed. I admit that I need help with my faith. I admit that I'm struggling with doubt. Lord, help my unbelief. I'm not just praying for you to help my son, but I'm praying for you to help my faith. Church, this man shows us, watch this now. This man shows us what we must do with our crippled and wounded faith. No matter how crippled and wounded and weak our faith is, we need to put whatever faith we have in Christ and trust him to work with the little faith that we have because some faith is better than no faith at all. I'm telling you that he says I have faith Lord and I'm going to give that to you and the part that I'm struggling with I'm asking for your help with it all I'm saying is this don't wait till your faith is great before you ask God to help you with your problems use what you have until you can get what you don't have in other words use your little faith while you seek to develop great faith notice that the man said Lord I believe I believe help my unbelief he said, I believe in you, Lord. I do believe in you. I believe that you have the power to help me. But I'm also confessing that I struggle with doubt. And I'm asking for you to help me to overcome my doubt. Here's the key. Here's the key as we close. 
dealing with this conundrum of when faith and doubt collide on the highway of life. What should we do? First, we need to resist the doubt. Fight it back. Call on what you know about God. Not what you think or feel, but what you know. Second, we need to admit that the doubt is there. Third, we need to confess the doubt to God. And fourth, we need to pray to God for deliverance from the doubt. That's how we deal with it when faith and doubt collide on the highway of life. We need to do those things. We need to resist it. We need to admit it. We need to confess it. And we need to pray about it. Because both confession, why? Because both confession and prayer are acts of faith. For me to confess my faith, uh, confess my doubts, is to believe that there is a God who will hear that prayer. And when I pray to God, we will hear that confession. And when I pray to him, there is a God who will hear that prayer. And I believe that that God is able to help me. So to confess your doubt and to pray to God about overcoming your doubt is but to manifest faith in God because you believe that he can indeed help you to overcome it. Let me close now. Verses 25 through 29. When Jesus saw the people coming together, running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to a deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. I love it, boy. When Jesus fixes you, he fixes you well. Ain't that good news? Ain't that good news? He said, come out of him and don't go back in him ever again. Look at the next verse. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him and he became as one dead. So that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Jesus heard his cry and he answered his prayer. He not only, watch this, he not only healed his boy, but in the same moment he strengthened his faith. Because he did what the father could not do and what the disciples could not do. And he gave him his son back and then he told his disciples that you need to stay connected to your power source. That's the reason that you could not be successful. And church, we do that, stay connected to our power source, Jesus Christ, through prayer. And there is a need for fasting. We don't say enough about fasting. But in this case, we need to do all that. In this case, fasting is also in some translations, it's there and some it's not. But, but fasting is a part of staying connected with our power source. When we're dealing with something that just keeps hanging on in our life, fasting and prayer is a way to exercise it from our life. And most of all, staying in the word. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17, the Bible says, so then faith, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more of the word I put in my heart, the deeper and the greater and the stronger my faith becomes. Stay prayed up, stay read up, and God will strengthen your faith. I trust that this message has helped you. I just wanted to give you a message to encourage you in these difficult times to understand that we may struggle, but we don't have to give up. And we need to take what little faith we might have, put it in the hands of God and ask him to help us to develop great faith and God will do it. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ, we encourage you to become a member. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you're willing to repent of your sins, if you believe that Jesus came, he suffered, he bled, he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again. That he is the Christ, the Son of God. If you're willing to repent, to say, Lord, I'm ready to change my ways. I want to give my life to you. Confess his name. 
confess that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God like the eunuch did in the 8th chapter of the book of Acts verses 35 and 36 where the eunuch said I believe that Jesus, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and then be buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of your sins according to Acts 2 and verse number 38 and the Lord in heaven will add you to his church according to Acts 2 and verse 47. If we can help you, please contact us here at the Church of Christ at Eastside at 512-477-1647. God bless you, and I trust that you've been helped through the proclamation of God's Word. Once again, we want...